actually one of the uh, first thermophiles, which is the name of the bacteria that can grow at particularly high temperatures, was found in Yellowstone by a guy named Thomas Brock, an environmental microbiologist. And that bacterium uh, called Thermus aquaticus was uh, later exploited to make something called polymerase chain reaction. So I don't know if you've, if you've heard of polymerase chain reaction. That's the technique that's used <coughs> in forensics and in a lot of techniques to take a tiny amount of DNA and amplify it to make as much as you want. Um, for example, uh, uh, the first World Trade Center bombers, uh, the ones that set off a bomb that didn't bring down the building, set it off in the basement, uh, were identified to, were proven to have mailed a letter by finding DNA on the back of the postage stamp that was used to, to mail the letter to, to uh, uh, let people know the bomb was coming. Anyway, this polymerase chain reaction is a, a, a chemical reaction that requires a number of steps of heating up the DNA to boiling point where the two strands of the double helix fall apart and they make new DNA. And then they, you, you keep doing this over and over, heating it up to the boiling point to, the, to, to separate the strands of DNA. And you need a, a, an enzyme copying a protein that can stand boiling over and over and over. And so. Um, that enzyme is extracted from a bacterium that's uh, uh, found in one of these hot springs. Okay, Here's another paint pots. Again, all this color, actually, if you dig down in there, you'll find the mats of uh, bacteria. Uh, and archaea, which kind of look like bacteria, but have a kind of different evolutionary origin. I don't want to go into the difference between archaea and bacteria, but they look the same. They look single cell, no nucleus, but they, uh, their DNA is actually uh, somewhat different from, from that of bacteria. So still DNA, and it still uh, looks like they all came back from the original origin of life, but they're uh, uh, enough different that they're classified as a completely different domain. Uh, let's see, if you just turn to the next one. This, this is one of the most spectacular of the hot springs, I think, and in fact, this picture was used on a cover of a microbiology textbook because again the colors that you see here except for the deep blue uh, are due to microbial action. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale of this, this is a walkway here and there, there's a person would be about, you know, right, right there, there's a person walking down the walkway. So it's a really spectacular expression from, from the air. Now let's see, let's try the next one. If we're lucky, we, we can show it. I, uh, oh, I click on that. It, yeah. I have a little video clip. It was just a little video clip uh, narrated by Walter Cronkite on talking about the microbial diversity that you find at Yellowstone. And it's almost as important in terms of the microbial diversity as the other things like the bison and the wolves and so forth. And uh, Actually, the uh, Yellowstone has since, uh, people made hundreds of millions of dollars from this enzyme that I mentioned was extracted from a bacteria that could grow at, uh, in boiling, boiling water. And Yellowstone now has an, a, a legal agreement. If anybody goes in there prospecting for bacteria, they have to agree to share any of the profits of the, uh, uh, any biotech application of those bacteria with, with the Yellowstone Park so that they get something out of it. Okay. forces of the universe converge their power to create a most special place. A place where explorers throughout history have marveled at the wonders of nature. A place where clues to some of the deepest mysteries of life are obscured only by beauty.
As we explore the edges of the universe, <laughs> we developed a deeper understanding of humanity's place in the cosmos, creating an awareness of how valuable our planet's natural resources are, and just how dependent we are upon them. Hello, I'm Walter Kleinke. In 1872, the United States Congress created Yellowstone as the world's first national park inspired in part by the early scientific energy to learn more about the world around us and about our place in the universe. Yellowstone, America's Serengeti. Since its creation, the parks inspired a reverence for the land and the life on it. To that, Yellowstone remains faithful. Here the past echoes through nature's timeless architecture, a haven for life that's prospered from the land's protection. Just 30 years after becoming the world's first national park, Yellowstone provided refuge to the last free-roaming herd of bison in the United States. Other species threatened by habitat loss or over-exploitation also have found sanctuary at Yellowstone. Here it's easy to see how and why every species is precious and depends in some way on every other. Even life too small to see. Hidden behind shrouds of steam, lurks a most bizarre form of life, thriving in a most unlikely place, in the mysterious boiling waters of Yellowstone's 10,000 hot springs, geysers, and fumaroles. In 1966, a scientist named Thomas Brock lifted the lid on the upper temperature limits of life in Yellowstone, finding life too small to see in waters too hot to touch. From these discoveries, a new way of looking at Yellowstone was revealed. For centuries, this abundance of unseen life remained hidden, disguised as the beautiful colors that have delighted millions of visitors who marveled at Yellowstone's hot springs. While people the world over come to Yellowstone to see Arusi grizzlies, a visit to the park guarantees a peek at these more mysterious forms of life. It's an ancient world, microscopic and just waiting to be explored. Power from a 600,000 year old volcano still heats and churns the world's greatest concentration of thermal features right here at Yellowstone. It's hard to believe that life actually thrives in these boiling waters. To the tiny creatures living here, survival depends on the scalding heat. Just as the forest fires of 1988 renewed life at Yellowstone, the explosive power of an ancient volcano forms this place where nature's handicraft is still at work. Amazingly, the diversity of life in these hot springs is sometimes compared to tropical rainforests. Luckily, the same laws that protected the bison also preserved these exotic life forms and their unique habitats. What's astounding is that less than 1% of these microscopic creatures have been identified. That's why the same hot springs that attract millions of visitors each year also attract scientists like Anna Louise Reisenbach. She studies the origins of life on Earth in this unusual ecosystem. It's so unexpected. Oh, that's a micron there. Those yeah. are big guys. Yeah, yeah, they're on the left. Well, it's not about, well, you can't tell. This could be a cross-section. Yeah. Several microns long. That's a good size for bacteria. Okay. Okay, so we're going down deep in the ocean. The Alvin is one of the, uh, uh, for many years, has been the, the best submersible to go down and see what's happening down there. Although I just saw a little film clip from uh, uh, Richard Branson, I guess, is funding a new manned submersible 
submarine that will go to the very bottom of the deepest trenches. One person, take one person down, and uh, he's collaborating with some microbiologists at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography to see uh, what they can find down there. Because uh, there are other bacteria uh, called uh, piezophiles, which thrive at high pressures, like at the bottom of the ocean, where you have how maybe you can get up to a thousand atmospheres in the deepest trenches, and the bacteria can, can still thrive down there. It's about the only thing that can. There's, there's okay. fish, there's fish down there, too. Hmm? Remember the early uh, cameras they put down in the Philippine Trench, yeah. seven miles, and there, you can see fish swimming around there. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure, 30,000 feet mm -hmm. that they could see fish. Okay. Um, Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, oh, these smokers, yeah, they, these are kind of like uh, mineral vents that stick up from the bottom of the, of the ocean with uh, of the seafloor with, with smoke, black vents coming out of them. Some of them maybe 30, 40 feet tall, um, carrying, uh, carrying uh, subsurface uh, chemicals up to heat it. And the water, seawater sea gets down through cracks down into these chambers underneath, gets heated and comes spurting back up. Kind of the same principle as the geysers at, at, at Yellowstone. Okay, next one. Well, Let's try this one. Huh? Oh, that'll be the, the movie one. That didn't work before. You want to go to the internet? Yeah, let's try the internet one. This, this should be the next yeah. one. Wait, a couple months ago, my wife and I went down to Marin, the Marin uh, speaker series and heard Robert Ballard, the guy who went <coughs> on the uh, well, Titanic <coughs> with uh, submersibles. And he mentioned there that actually yeah. it was all funded by the Navy. They really wanted to find some uh, yeah. nuclear submarines that had, had sunk there. <laughs> and they didn't want the Russians to know that they were, no. they were uh, doing what they were doing, so they covered it up by saying he was looking for the Titanic. Okay. The Pacific Ocean, 250 miles off the coast of the Galapagos Islands. In 1977, a deep sea submarine descended over 8,000 feet. Its mission? To investigate hydrothermal activity on the ocean floor. Marine explorer Robert Ballard was aboard. He detected a dramatic change in the ocean's temperature. You know, we were not expecting what we found. We were expecting to find water. And we had a camera inside the vehicle, but it was it was uh, just taking pictures, so we didn't know what we had until we came back. We brought it up to the surface, and we processed the film, and we got we knew the spot where the temperature spike was, and it was like going to Disneyland. Probably one of the biggest biological discoveries ever made on Earth <laughs> was made <laughs> that day. <laughs> Ballard and his team were the first to see it. Face to face. There was a royal wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Immense chimney like structures, several stories high, spewing hot water geysers, black with minerals and nutrients. The temperature around these deep sea vents was a scorching 760 degrees Fahrenheit. And then an astonishing sight life thriving without sunlight. A biological community never seen before. <laughs> An exotic garden of marine life. Species without eyes. Others resembling Triassic era fossils, over 200 million years old. What we totally were blown away by were these giant tube worms. Oh, um, tube worms. Eight, nine, ten feet tall. And when you cut them, they bled human-like blood. I mean, when the submarine landed, there was a squish, and red blood came up around all the portholes. That's how, how eerie it was. And then to find these extremely unusual creatures living in this oasis, it had no relationship to the normal life of the deep sea. And yet here they were living in this toxic water, but yet these creatures were thriving on it. And then when we dissected, I remember we took one of these clams, and we opened it up in the first place, whew, as soon as we opened it up, it stunk. It was full of hydrogen sulfur. Horrible smell. Rotten eggs. Yeah. And we opened it up, and then we looked, 
and and it didn't look it, it looked like beef. It was red, bright red, and it didn't have an anatomy of a clam. It was like, what happened to the clam? Someone had taken over its body, and that something was a bacteria, a tiny bacteria that had figured out over eons of time how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark chemically through a process we now call chemosynthesis. And that was the discovery, that there was another life system on Earth that did not go by the book that you and I read, that was not living off the energy of the sun, but was living off the energy of the Earth itself. And that really opens up the ball game. I'll say. And these bacteria, we now think are the largest mass of living things on Earth. But they're, they're in the rocks. They're in the whole mountain range. Under the ocean. If you added up all the people and all the living things on land and add up all the creatures in the ocean and the th few things in the sky, and you got a number of so many tons, there's more tons of biomass. You just think, you know, the, the, the insects rule the earth. Right. Wrong. These bacteria. So where are these vents? All over the earth. They were, imagine a baseball with a seam on it. That seam begins beneath the polar ice caps, goes down through the Atlantic, into the Indian Ocean, across the Pacific. It runs around the Earth for 42,000 miles. It's the largest feature on Earth, the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And it's underlain by literally tens of thousands of magma chambers. Is that where life began in well, the last spring? Well, that's what people are now thinking. The, the biology books that we were reading, that been thrown away. Yeah. And they're right. writing you everything. You had to be on the surface. That's right. And you had this soup and the lightning bolt hit it, and you formed all sorts of amino acids and things like that. But now what we think is that the, the hydrothermal vents may have been the site of life on Earth. It's also given us a new prospecting tool for searching for it elsewhere with our own solar system. We're now looking at a moon of Jupiter called Europa, which we think has an ocean. We think it has underwater volcanoes, and there should be life down there. The question is, how smart are their clams? Smarter than you can. The first primitive microbes on Earth? Perhaps. But one thing is certain. Their discovery challenged long-held beliefs about the conditions necessary for creating life. And once life happened, there was no stopping. Yeah, Ballard, I mean, he tends to exaggerate. I mean, that's one possibility that life evolved around these vents. So other people have theories that evolved it in cold conditions where all the uh, unstable intermediate can, can hang around longer to interact with each other. Um, he also said at the talk that we went to that, uh, well, we know now that the Earth was seeded by life from Mars, and that's where, where life on Earth started. So. Uh, Mars? <laughs> well, that, that rock that, that they found, that meteorite that they found, that, that, that when they broke it op open, uh, uh, that Mars rock, they found things that, they found that something looked like a bacterium inside. <clears throat> but other people think that that is just an artifact that you can find these with uh, non-biological um, origins. So uh, that's still, still not clear that that rock um, contain anything that was once living. There was just an experiment published in the last couple days about uh, somebody growing uh, bacteria under 400,000 Gs. I don't know if you saw that in the news, but they uh, put bacteria in a centrifuge and got, it up, got them up to 400,000 uh, force of gravity, and they were still multiplying. They were E. coli that were able to do this. <laughs> And uh, I think one of the reasons they did it is that they, they actually said that in, during this impact that knocked this rock off of Mars, uh, that, that, that the rock might have, have gone through it as much as 400,000 Gs. So they're just trying to see whether life could have survived if it had been in a rock on, on another planet. So um, okay. we still, you know, still lots of guesses about origins of life. And uh, one of the reasons they thought it might have come from Mars is Mars cooled off sooner than her being smaller, and so it would have had a head start in terms of uh, uh, starting life. Okay, next. Oh, these are the pictures of these two worms. Uh, this, that, this red here is the, the blood he was talking about. I don't know why he said it looks like human blood. I mean, uh, it's, it's very distantly related. It's, hemo, it's a kind of hemoglobin that binds oxygen and turns red. But otherwise, uh, it's no more like human blood than, than uh, 
any other animal. Um, and actually, these, these worms have no, no mouth, no anus or anything. Actually, all the, the, the uh, they're, they're provided with, with, with energy by uh, bacteria that are uh, inside them. Let's see if it's the next slide. Uh, this purple, what's colored here purple, is actually just masses of bacteria under this, the skin of this uh, tube worm. And the chemicals are coming in. Uh, through, there is some oxygen down at, at the depth that you find these things, and oxygen comes in, and, and, and the bacteria, uh, using the, the chemicals in the uh, seawater, are able to uh, actually get some of these absorbed chemicals that provide uh, energy to these tube worms. Is, is that kind of unique for it to have a hemoglobin in blood? Do invertebrates usually have? Uh, well, just any, any you the question? question? So well, the question is, is it unique for it to have hemoglobin? Well, just about any hemoglobin is pretty ubiquitous in the animal world. Don't uh, invertebrates have copper, copper carrying? Um, oh, you're saying, oh, they would have heme instead of copper, something like that. Um, that I, I, I can't say. I don't know what the distribution of the, of the uh, uh, copper containing globins are. Yeah, Ballard was surprised to see it coming up. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's see, next one, next slide. Just uh, uh, recently, it, it was thought that oxygen was necessary for, uh, for growth of multicellular animals. There are a lot of single-celled animals that can get by actually without <coughs> oxygen, but just recently they found a, it actually on the floor of the Mediterranean in a kind of a salt basin where there wasn't any mixing with the water at the bottom of the Mediterranean with the, with the upper oxygenated <coughs> surfaces. They found a, uh, something called muricoferrin, a multicellular animal that uh, was not, was in an area where there was no, essentially no oxygen and they were actually getting their, uh, their metabolism uh, from something called the hy <coughs> hydrogenosome which is something like a mitochondria. Mitochondria of animals uh, uses oxygen to, to create energy from sugars and things like that. Whereas these hydrogenosomes, instead of producing, uh, instead of using uh, uh, oxygen, actually can, can, can function with hydrogen. And they, they, they differ from mitochondria. They look like mitochondria in, in them, but, but uh, actually they don't have any DNA in them, so we don't know yet whether there was some kind of ancient bacterium that got in and then lost its DNA, but, or its DNA got incorporated into the chromosomes of the animal itself. But it, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, observation because it's, it, it was always thought that you had to have oxygen to power you know, multicellular organisms. Yeah. Kind of on the note of multicellular. So you're saying that some of these extremophiles seem like they can't exist in single cells. So does that kind of suggest that they're not, they're kind of in between being a single cell organism and a multi cell organism if they require other no, cells? No, it's just thought that the energetics of, 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 uh, of multicellular life required something that provided the energy to burn, burning things with oxygen. Right. And now it looks like at least some simple organisms can, can use this uh, hydrogenosome to, to power. Now we don't know how fast they're dividing or uh, how, how well they're thriving. But, uh, but when you were talking about uh, not being able to grow them in isolation, it it like, yeah. okay. So it sounds like the extremophiles in effect can't live in isolation if they're a single single entity with multi cells or just a group of. Dissimilar yeah, well, they have to stay together. It sounds like they have to have to have a mix. Um, uh, we don't. We don't really know for sure whether if we can't grow anything if it's because it needs uh, um, other organisms around or, or some micronutrient that we just oh. can't find. Although they try to grow them in the same uh, liquid that they find them in, that was they try to filter everything out and then and then try to grow them in that. Um, Sometimes they've actually found that if they make the or if they make the uh, the growth medium too rich, they die. They're used to living in very poor environments, and and you can actually overwhelm them, and, and they'll die if you put them in too rich an environment. 
I, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, that was more for Earl. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to switch it. Uh, there, the extremes of life can be at you know pH, salt, um, radiation, and so forth. <coughs> and rather than try to co cover them all, I'm just going to cover a few different groups of them. One, one that's particularly interesting, I think, are the ones that you grow in very high salt concentrations. Uh, but this is one of those micro world <laughs> sites. Uh, next, next, next slide. <laughs> Uh, I guess these salt flats are disappearing now, but if you flew in and out of uh, San Francisco airport, sometimes you can see these purple uh, lakes <clears throat> and, and various colors. And these are the colors are actually coming from bacteria that are growing, and our kids are growing in these salt ponds just as the water evaporates. I mean, they, they think you can see water evaporating, the, the water to condense the salt down. As the salt concentration goes up, these guys start thriving. In fact, uh, it's good for them because it drives away the competition. A lot of the bacteria can't grow in these very high saturated salt uh, solutions, and so only the ones that they call halophiles are able to grow under those conditions. Okay. If you look in the salt crystals in, in, in some of these lakes, they're, they're completely dried up. Actually, this, this is not a salt crystal. This is, the salt crystal is much bigger than this screen. This is what's called an inclusion, a little hole cavity inside the salt crystal. And inside that, sometimes you can see saturated salt liquid, and they find bacteria, even the algae trapped sometimes inside these salt crystals. And if you break these open sterilely, you can actually get out bacteria that are, that are alive. In other words, they get trapped in there. Later, <coughs> you release them from the salt crystal. They're, they're, it can be cultured in high salt concentrations. And let's see the next picture. Does that mean they've been dormant for a tremendously long time or something? Well, that's the claim. That I, it, it's, it, seems, um, it seems impossible, but, but some of these salt deposits were laid down hundreds of millions of years ago. And that was before the dinosaurs. And yet they still claim they can go down to pristine areas that don't look like they've ever been infiltrated by water from above and pull out viable bacteria. Wow. And the chemists say this is, should be theoretically impossible, that the DNA should not be stable that long, that the bases will fall off, and that uh, uh, you shouldn't be able to, but, but it's it been done reproducibly in, in uh, the salt mines of uh, Western New York. Austria. New York, too. In Austria, in New York. Yeah, yeah. actually, I have a. I, I think I'll skip the, I had a little film uh, of some guys at the University of uh, uh, New York, Binghamton. Uh, they've been doing some studies on this. And uh, some of the salt crystals have come from this uh, project they were doing in New Mexico to look for a place to bury nuclear waste. They were trying to find an area that, that was stable and been, uh, not infiltrated by, by, by water. Oh, uh, I wouldn't uh, yeah, they, they, they claim to isolate bacteria and these two million year old uh, rock crystals that they found down in these uh, mines they were di digging in New Mexico to uh, uh, bury nuclear waste. Then it got later moved to Nevada, but they didn't want Nevada either, so. Okay, uh, keep going. Obama. Okay, I want to talk now about psychrophiles, which are organisms that love cold climate. Uh, uh, this is Nostoc, this is a photosynthetic bacterium that, uh, that, that, that you find in, in very cold climates, okay, like Antarctica. Um, they've been coring, uh, taking ice cores from dri drilling through uh, Greenland glaciers, trying to find out what the composition was of the atmosphere at various, various times. And they, even from a, a section of an ice core that was dated 120,000 years ago, they've been able to you know, sterilize the outside, go in there sterilely, and, and pull out viable bacteria. So, <laughs> uh, but then you, would, you might expect that, you know, that, that ice would help you know, preserve things. There are also claims that they can find bacteria, uh, growing bacteria in, in permafrost that has 
hardly know it, fought for thousands of years. Yeah, when I was at Berkeley, we had problems with B. subtilis growing in hexane at minus 40 C. Where? B. subtilis yeah. was growing at minus 40? In hexane. In pure <laughs> hexane. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an ice cream. It wasn't in crystals. So no, it was, it was growing in colonies. Well, that's okay. Wow. Well, I find that hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Although maybe, well, you'll see, they grow in all kinds of conditions. All right, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I had a chance uh, while I was in this life in the extreme environment program to fly down to the Antarctica to the, uh, here's New Zealand, we flew to New Zealand and like in this seven hour flight in a C-130 to uh, what's called the uh, McMurdo base, which is the largest base, a U.S. base uh, in Antarctica, uh, about 800 miles from the South Pole. Uh, next picture. It wasn't a very pleasant flight down uh, it was noisy, and if you sat down, it was cold. You stood up, it was hot. Um, <laughs> look, hardly anywhere you can look out the windows for this seven hour flight. There were little tiny little portholes. Was the movie good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no movies. <laughs> yeah. No movies. Uh, this is the director of the, then the director of the National Science Foundation, Rita Caldwell, who happened to be a microbiologist. And she's kind of in hot water right now because she's been put in charge of the. Uh, Big fund that BP set up to do research on the Gulf, and it's all tied up in politics. And a lot of the Gulf states want to make sure the money gets goes to the scientists, you know, in the states that were most damaged by the uh, oil spill. So maybe she's been put in charge of that multi-billion-dollar fund that was set up, which has hardly paid for anything so far. I understand biologist. What is, what is her training? Uh, she's a microbiologist. I understand they're not as used to dealing with lots of money like physicists. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, they kind of got into the uh, genome projects, and uh, that takes some money. But that's yeah, true. the physicists. Yeah, there's nothing for it. In fact, I, I remember a guy from France telling me that uh, they ought to build a. a uh, several kilometer long intestatron, you know, studying the microbes as they fly through. Plug the corn nuts through. You heard it here. I don't know, you can't, probably can't see enough of this lady here, but that's our uh, Congresswoman Woolsey. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That looks she like was actually uh, at, at this, is now, this is January 2000. She was actually on the House Science and Technology Committee, and she was going to the South Pole to, to look at the uh, building of a new station, a new South Pole station that the government was funding, multi, multi million dollars. And you said Rita's in hot water lately. Is she an extremophile? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should just say, I think she can. Uh, uh, Phil? Yeah. Your blurb said you started off in physics and soon hit the hard stuff. What happened? <laughs> yeah. How did you get into biology from physics? Okay, I was a physics major at Caltech, and uh, we were in our sophomore year, we were required to take, I'd never taken biology in high school, we were required to take a biology course, a one quarter biology course, and, and the guy who was teaching it was a guy named George Beadle, who was a, a, a geneticist who, uh, showed that it came up with the one gene, one enzyme thing in, in bread mold. And he brought in a, a speaker, a, a guy to talk to us named uh, Max Delbruck, who uh, grew up as a physicist in Germany and worked with Lisa Meitner and then gave up, well, wanted to get out of Germany in the 30s uh, and came to the US and changed his field to biology. And he picked uh, bacterial viruses. He said, let's find something really simple that we can work on, and once we work that out, then we can go to animal genes and things like that. And uh, he turned, Jim Watson had just spent a couple of years in his lab after leaving Crick in, in Cambridge, came to Caltech to work with uh, Delbrook, and so he was talking about DNA and all the information that was stored in DNA, and they didn't know the genetic code. Anyway, I thought that was just so fascinating, the idea of information being stored in, in, in DNA and then trying to figure out how it got out, or how it got out. So that, that's what turned me on to biology. So, um, so then I, I stayed and got my degree in physics, but ended up going into biophysics as a graduate Okay, anyway, let's yeah, continue on. So we landed actually in Antarctica near this uh, mountain, 
which is actually a volcano. So even though Antarctica is very, very cold, uh, there are some hot parts of it. It's part of this, this whole uh, ring of fire around the Pacific. Goes all the way down into Antarctica. So this is actually uh, there's actually some some uh, smoke coming off the top of this thing. Okay. Uh, this, uh, what really impressed me there was that there was a lot of bacterial growth in, in ponds. I was there in January, which is the middle of summer in Antarctica, and some of the ice had started melting. And in all these ponds, there were these mats of material here. Uh, which are actually, uh, let's see, go to the next next slide. Uh, here's, here's, here's one of these mats sort of exposed on the surface. Um, and they're, they're photosynthetic bacteria. They also produce kind of a gooey uh, uh, surrounding that, that kind of, I guess, protects them in the winter when it gets perpetual darkness and everything freezes. And so we were actually studying these, these uh, Photosynthetic bacteria that were in these, in these mats, We're trying to figure out how many different species there were from their DNA. Well, on on our uh, in in the lab was a, a guy who uh, uh, was an underwater photographer. And let me see. Uh, the next one. The next. Oh, sorry. This is another picture. <laughs> I had to take this picture. This is called Blood Falls in Antarctica. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but this is. Uh, a glacier that actually, uh, so several million years ago, appears to have moved over a lake and trapped a lot of, uh, of um, water under, underneath it. And sometimes the water leaks out and it's full of uh, iron, which when it hits the at atmosphere, turns, turns, oxidizes, turns red, and uh, and actually it's loaded with bacteria. So these bac they think these bacteria have been functioning uh, under under this glacier for uh, potentially millions of years. Um, let's see, next, next. Well, one of the areas that, that's been a, of, of a lot of interest is another underwater lake called Lake Bostock. And it's located, uh, here's, here's where McMurdo was, here's the South Pole. And it's located out in the middle of nowhere and it's, it's the area where the Russians decided to build their base. They kicked the most remote part of uh, pretty much of, of Antarctica to build their, their base. They must have felt right at home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all they are like all to me. <laughs> when we flying over the eyes of the uh, radar, they were able to find a, a evidence of a big lake underneath uh, about 160 by 30 miles wide. Uh, 13,000 feet below the surface of the ice. This is what the radar picked up. So they decided to drill down to see what was down there. Uh, let's see the next slide. Oh, this is just a picture of the base. <laughs> uh, here's the drill set up over here. It's pretty primitive compared to, to the one I was in. McMurdo uh, has about 800 people there during the summer. And uh, two bowling alleys and uh, ATM machines and bars. And three bars, anyway. Actually, the Russians have them. <laughs> uh, anyway, they decided to drill down to this uh, lake and see if there was any life down there. So the next picture is sort of a schematic of this. Uh, here's the Vostok station. Oh, yeah, they also recorded the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth at this Vostok station. I think the previous slide had minus 137, something like that. 129 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, yeah. Anyway, that would have been in the middle of winter, you know, with months of no, no sun. Anyway, they, they've been drilling down through this ice, and uh, this is the, the lake down here. This is, they, you know, they wonder what's keeping this from, from freezing, and one thought is there maybe there's some geothermal activity. That's just a guess. So. Uh, they're almost down to the uh, water. This. February, I think, it got too cold for them to continue, and they stopped like a, a few hundred feet from the from the uh, from the water. But uh, when scientists in, outside of Russia found out they were actually pouring uh, kerosene down this hole to keep it from refreezing as they were drilling, he said, "Please stop. You know, we don't want to contaminate this pristine lake. This lake has been separated down here 
for apparently millions of years um, and contaminated with all this crud you're putting down. So we're trying to, trying to do it sterilely and, and cleanly now for the last last part of it. There's probably vodka down there now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there, there are about 100 of these underwater lakes. This is the biggest of them that's uh, been found in Antarctica. And it would be really interesting to study any life that's out there. Excuse me, there's like, they're starting to pick up bacteria as they get into this kind of spongy, uh, virtually uh, up, uh, ice at the top. Okay. So that's, actually, NASA's very interested in this because they, uh, there's been one of the, Europa, which was mentioned by Ballard, is one of the uh, satellites of, of Jupiter. It seems to have an icy surface and it's fractured and the astronomers physicists claim that this looks like it may have water underneath the ice, liquid water under the ice, from the way the water the surface breaks up. And, uh, and they also think that the uh, tremendous pull of gravity of, of, of Jupiter is creating uh, tidal forces that are generating heat in this satellite uh, or moon of, of Jupiter. Now, uh, the only way I can see that could happen would be if the moon were rotating as it's going around you could oscillates a little bit yeah and it goes in and out yeah it could oscillate because if you have something like the moon which is facing us you're not going to get tides on the moon because it's one face is always facing but still the orbit is elliptical so yeah a little bit of tugging yeah, yeah. and evidently the gravity is so strong and then the also mentioned the interaction earthquake. between the different moons can even interact with each other and create tunnel forces so NASA's thinking, well, if we can figure out how to sample Lake Vostok, we might be able to have a, figure out how to sample this. This is the next one. Uh, oh, this is closer up to the surface, some various fractures. On, on the, okay, the next one. So what they're proposing is that land, they could land something on, on, on this, and it would, it would create a, uh, it would have a probe, which maybe could heat up on the outside and kind of uh, melt its way through, which uh, down into the, uh, bottom of the ice and then release some sort of little camera kind of thing with a light to go down. And again, this is hypothetical like they have at the bottom of the uh, uh, Lake Vostok. You know, maybe there are hydrothermal bits there. Maybe that could be an origin of the light. I wanted, since I'm talking about extreme environments, uh, we had a guy with us uh, in Antarctica who was an underwater photographer. Norbert nice. Wu from, from uh, Monterey, his home is in Monterey. And he was taking all these pictures underwater. Um, this is, you can see this ice shelf here coming down all the way from the surface down to the, to the bottom of the water. Now this, this might seem to you like an extreme environment, okay? The water here is like below zero centigrade because it's got salt in it, so it can, it can be a little bit below uh, freezing point of pure water and still be liquid. So um, the, the next picture is, shows a uh, one of the fish that you see down in this area. And um, this might seem like an extreme environment, but what was pointed out to me is it's really a very stable environment. It's always like one degree below freeze below zero. It doesn't fluctuate. It, it, if things heat up a little more, the ice melts, but it's always still in contact with the ice, so it's always about the same. So that's actually a pretty nice environment to uh, not have it fluctuating back and forth. Are these the transparent fish without the hemoglobin? That's these uh, are not transparent. Oh, I know, yeah, there's a description. Uh, there's some, some fish that are mentioned in... Uh, uh, Sean Carroll's... Yeah, uh, Sean Carroll's book. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, but they, they, these fish do have genes which make a kind of a, uh, a polymer which is an antifreeze. Yeah. They, they can function well uh, under, under the uh, at, at below zero temperature. And uh, there was some excitement uh, by the, uh, the, the ge genetically modified food. Uh, people worry about that. The next, next slide. Uh, there was a proposal. They actually tried to put They actually isolated the genes for this antifreeze from this fish and put them into tomatoes to see if they would keep them from being frosted, killed by frost. And uh, um, 
the Franken food people really uh, <laughs> uh, talked a lot about this and scared people, and I think they stopped, they dropped that project. There's no longer talking about putting animal genes into, uh, into food products to keep them from uh, getting frosted. <laughs> Okay, next. Uh, although I'm, this was advertised to be about microbes, I've come across a few uh, uh, larger organisms that, that seem amazing to me. One is a Himalayan midge that was found on, on a glacier in uh, Nepal by a Japanese researcher, actually crawling around on the surface at minus 16 degrees centigrade. Now there's water down, percolating down underneath here, which is warmer, and that's where they evidently uh, lay their eggs and, and uh, develop. But, but on the surface, they're actually walking around at minus 16 degrees uh, air temperature. And uh, uh, I don't know anybody, if anybody's isolated the genes from these yet, too. I haven't seen anything about them uh, in terms of how they uh, manage to do this. Okay. Uh, so it's getting it's 8 o'clock, and I kind of wanted to talk about some evolutionary studies. Um, have any of you heard of William Dallinger? I, I just learned about him several months ago. He was a, a Methodist minister who was excited by reading Darwin's Origin of the Species, and he started studying how uh, uh, studying, um, what's his name? Automatic. Um, no, I, I did it by mistake. Yeah. I'm going to go back. He was studying, he, he got protozoa, single celled animals. Uh, this is a protozoan. You can see, even though it's a single cell, it's not, you know, cilia and lots of other things. So it's, it's, it's not uh, not just a, like, like a bacterium. It's much more complicated bacterium. But anyway, he devised this machine, and that's on the next one where uh, he found they could just barely grow at 73 degrees Fahrenheit. They liked best 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but at 73 degrees Fahrenheit, they could just grow. And over a period of seven, seven years, he kept cranking up the temperature of these uh, uh, incubation pots here, and he would he, it increase it a couple degrees and then leave it for a while, and then things would stop, and then they'd start growing again, and keep bumping up, and he finally got them to grow at 158 degrees Fahrenheit after seven years. They could not grow it back at the original temperature. They had actually evolved over seven years, you could say evolved from being able to grow at, at this temperature, 73, and now they can grow back. So it shows how fast something can move into these uh, uh, niches. Into these niches, yeah. Now, unfortunately, his, his, his machine failed at that time. They all died and he wasn't able to see it. push it to the limits. I guess it even just if it had cooled off, it, it would have killed him because these ones that were growing at 158, could not survive at 73. Hmm. Yeah, Roger. Phil, is that is that what they mean by induction when they start monkeying around the bacteria and making them change characteristics over period? Well, it's selection. I mean, it's just it's just mutation and selection. I mean, here they were natural mutations. He wasn't adding it. Now, now when if you were to do this now, you might add alum UV light or something to speed up the, the mutation rate so you could. Um, have, have it occur faster. In fact, people have done so far in, there's one lab at Michigan State where they've done 50,000 generations of E. coli in the, in the lab, watching it evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, but not, not, not at high temperature. But anyway, he, after he got his results, he communicated them to, uh, um, pardon, pardon me. <coughs> he, he, he published his results, and, and, and this was really the first uh, evidence that, uh, that he could observe evolution in, 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 a, in like a human scale. It, it, nobody had ever, and I guess still haven't seen new species. Well, it's hard to see new species, completely new species evolve, but at least you could see them evolve into a, uh, a different niche, and, and Darwin thought that this was actually a uh, confirmation of his, of his theory. So, um, anyway, the, what I'm trying to show you is that the organisms can evolve and, and, uh, uh, and sometimes pretty fast uh, into niches where, where we just never thought they could grow before the, 
The highest temperature bacterium is uh, called 121 because it grows at 121 degrees centigrade. You have to grow it in a pressure cooker because you can't get water above 100 degrees without putting it under pressure. And uh, it wasn't just you know, 20 years ago, people thought this was impossible, that you couldn't find anything if you're growing that temperature. And yet, I think we're just really starting to, uh, to, to find that uh, life is really much more uh, durable than, than, than we expected. So we've got keep it Yeah. Uh, Phil, right about now, based on recent events, it seems appropriate to ask if you know anything about bacteria that favor a high radiation environment. Oh man, I was going to talk about, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. What about the, how to come back maybe? Oh, we're talking about high radiation? Yeah. Yeah, okay. whatever they want. Yeah, I know. We're running past our 8 o'clock time. There are bacteria that can grow in nuclear reactors. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dimococcus radiodurans, it's called. And, uh, and, uh, it was found in, uh, when they were trying to preserve foods with the radiation, they got used for nuclear waste as a radiate foods to preserve them. So, and, uh, it survived the uh, thing to kill everything else. Well, no, that's a good segue. <laughs> Speaking of radiation, aren't we doing something on radiation, Robert? Yes, he hasn't been told, but he's going to help us. I think he, we need some help, don't we? Uh, we have a cancellation in a couple of weeks. Uh, and so we thought that uh, we'd get some help and do it on nuclear radiation. It seems to be a popular subject. And so we're going to get a number of people to say something about it and invite others to bring their ideas or questions. And we're going to talk about radiation in many of its aspects. Well, this will be our first flight of the new mad science bus. Yeah.